The next presentation will be by Marcus Norberry from the University of Schölde and uh, teaching the dark art of deception. Setting the stage. The lecture on uh, right after lunch on the second day, the dream time for everyone. So that's fun. So, but we will actually have a bit of fun and we will explore the dark side of life. So I will talk a little bit about what I'm going to do, obviously, and who I am. We'll talk a bit about social engineering, which is quite fun. And you'll learn more about that. Uh, we'll do a bit of a group work session. We'll do a voting and a debrief. And yes, there will be prizes. So there is a point to keep focus here. Um, I'm My field is basically lying, cheating, stealing, and getting people to do things they shouldn't do. So I'm, I've been researching it for ages, and I've been teaching it for a number of years now. So as we move into this session now, lie, sheet, and steal. Those are the uh, cornerstones of this section. So somewhat similar to the one on democracy uh, that we had uh, before lunch. Uh, it's kind of the same ideals, depending on where you come from politically. Uh, but I've been doing this for ages. I'm an whatever associate professor in informatics. Uh, so this is what I uh, teach. My PhD thesis was on social engineering, as this is called, which is basically getting people to do things they shouldn't do. So you're going to learn life skills today. This is fun stuff. So uh, people are laughing. That's a good thought. So social engineering as a concept is a fairly well-established term for two very different things. So we have an architect here. So you're probably familiar with the one of the use of centralized planning in an attempt to manage societal change. That is not what we'll be playing around with today. What we'll look at today is in the context of information security, the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information that may be used for fraudulent purposes. Fun. So one of the challenges of this is how do you teach people to do this in an ethical way? Because in order to be able to prevent against it and protect against it, you need to know how the attackers work. What are the attacks? And this puts us in an interesting ethical dilemma, because if we only teach how we prevent this, people won't get the full insight. But do we want people how to commit crimes? because we have a very nice toolbox on how to do very well working crimes. And this is a slightly unique perspective that we face in information security. Uh, I mean, obviously people do it in policing, in law, et cetera also, but in healthcare, it's not like you're going to get your students to play around buying a virus. But in this case, that's something that we have to do. We like to call it black hat or white hat thinking. Black hack, hat, cowboy movies. So black hats are to act like the bad guy and white hat is to act at the, as the protector. Of course, we only want our students to be white hats in the long run. We don't want to train people to do bad things. But this is a constant ethical hurdle for us in our field, because in many cases, we are going to find exploits that can be used for bad as well as for good. So ethics is a cornerstone of what we're doing, uh, but we still need to teach students this stuff. So now you're going to get the crash course on social engineering. So there's a bunch of fun things you can do or effective things or scary things, depending on your perspective. The first tool set that's commonly used is something called pretexting. This is the attacker acting to be someone else. Like we have a fantastic technical support here. I don't know you. 
So you could literally, for me, be anyone in from the street with a name tag on saying that you're going to help me with my presentation. And I would trust you because you look like a trustworthy person. Yes. So you can pretend to be someone else and people will believe that. And you can pretend to be from the agencies. So as I was standing in line for lunch yesterday, my wife told me that she just got a phone call, randomly enough in English, from the Swedish police calling from Malta, telling her that her identity had been stolen. Now, there's a lot of warning signs there, but still someone acting or saying that they are from the Swedish police, saying something has happened and that she needs to call a specific number. That someone acting with a pretext of being someone else, pretending to be someone else. You have OSINT, which you don't need to remember, which is basically that you look someone up online. You can find on most people, myself included, a scaringly large amount of information. So a number of years ago, I had a student of mine who, without telling me before, which was really not a good thing, did a complete report about what could be found about me online, which ended up being, you know, 12 pages of bad jokes on Twitter or pictures of my dog, which, you know, what's whatever it was. But he also did a mistake of including my wife in this, and she's really not up for grabs on that end. So it became a bit of a thing. But... It's interesting because you can find a lot of things, a lot of information about most of us. But you can also find information about someone if they're not online. So if you do work with a high security uh, aspect or you're in intelligence or, in, or you're in one of those fields and you don't exist online, that's almost a proof that you are into a very sensitive area. So that's a constant challenge for the friends we have in intelligence, for instance. If you don't exist online, that's almost as suspicious as being too available. So OSINT is to use open sources to find more information. This can also mean, of course, that you call people up. Most pe uh, countries in Europe have some policies of be having a lot of public data. So you can, for instance, call the university up and just ask for information about students or employees, etc. So you can gather a lot of data on that end. Phishing, you probably have all heard about malicious emails. If someone hasn't heard about phishing at this day and age, we have a massive problem. Phishing is that you send a lot of emails to people, either getting them to click on a link or install a piece of software. You send these out to millions and millions and millions of people. The success rate is typically 0.0002%, I believe it is. So like one in 50,000 are successful, but it's still a good business because it costs roughly a dollar to send a million verified emails. So that's a scale attack. You also have spear phishing, which is a targeted attack. So instead of you getting an email from eBay saying, please update or verify your account. You get a specific email in a context that you assume you're going to get an email from. Now, how many of you are flying from here tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? So let's say that you get an email from the airline saying that you your flight is overbooked, but click on this link, please, to get upgraded to business class on a later that might be a tad more tempting to click on now than just you know verify your eBay account. And go back to the previous point of OSINT, open source intelligence. It's going to be fairly easy to find a bunch of us here in Greece now because some of us posted on Instagram. So it's not super complicated to create a targeted specific attack. And spear phishing is targeted to time and content. So I know that I, for instance, if I get an email from my train company or my hotel in Stockholm or the airline, et cetera, I'm going to be more prone to click on that. So that's spear phishing. Fun side note, the typical success rate of spear phishing is 70%. Yes. So imagine you're going from on a general phishing attack, 0.002%, which is basically nothing, to 70%. And I actually did studies on this myself, and we do average on between 60 to 70%. So that's ridiculously effect, uh, effective and quite hard to, to protect against. 
you have whaling. Because once again, in information security, things need to have cool names. Uh, that's just a trait. Whaling is targeting a specific VIP person or pretending to be one. So maybe the chancellor of your university calls you and tells you that you need to click on a link or call a specific number. Or it's the chairman or it's the manager of a massive company or maybe a manager of one of your collaboration partners, etc. But it's a VIP that someone is acting to be like or specifically targeting. We have wishing which you might have heard about, which is basically large-scale phone attacks. A number of years, we had something called the Microsoft attacks. Someone pretended to be from Microsoft. They called people up and told them, you need to install an important update on your computer. Most people didn't. Lots of people did. If you did install this important update from Microsoft, which had no affiliation whatsoever with Microsoft, you had to pay a ransom. And that ransom ended up being somewhere between 50 to 300 euros. I actually got called from a person pretending to be Microsoft, which was my lucky day because I like this kind of stuff. So I was the only person ever who was happy when they called me up. So I spent 15 minutes dis discussing firewalls with this person. Very fun on my end, not as fun for him. And I asked him, so we have this massive problem in Sweden, which is that people call to pretend to say that they are from Microsoft as a scam, but you're obviously from the real Microsoft. So how do you distinguish yourself from the fake Microsoft? And he was, I'm not going to do the Apu accent here, but he was like, well, I'm sorry, sir, but this is a scam. And then we had a nice discussion on that end, uh, just uh, what's the life of a scammer? And just to put things briefly into perspective, and this is actually quite interesting, there are roughly 350 employees where he works because this is a work. He earns 70% of what you do in normal tech support. So he was earning roughly, what is this, 700 euros a month. He worked six days a week, which is, you know, whatever it is, it's Indian tradition. This was based in India. And the most interesting part for me is how often do you succeed? And his average was 10 times a day because this entire scam is based on people on finding people who are gullible. They do not want to spend time with someone. They do not want someone who says, well, why are you calling for Microsoft? They want someone who says, oh my God, how can I fix this? Because it's a numbers game. So imagine doing the math on this and we do have a bunch of engineers here so you can easily do the math 10 times a day they don't go below 50 euros a case. So the least they earn every day is 500 euros. They work six days a week and they're earning 700 euros a month. I was like, okay, wow, someone is making a lot of money on this. And he was like, yes, sir, but it's not me. So, and then I have asked him, you know, I'm a professor in information security. Do you want to ask me something? And he's like, yes, I have one thing. Are you married? And I was like, uh, yes. And he was like, wow. And then I hang up. So I don't know really, the, the, but I do find it interesting um, to some degree. That's surprising. So baiting is when you put something up that might trick someone to visit a place. We've seen a lot of links now. So let's say that when you come to your hotel, there's a sign saying, visit this link and get a free drink. And you might be prone to do so. Uh, so you can either do it with physically putting something up or you could tell someone or you can have an offer at a bar just to visit this place, visit this fun website and register there and then you get some free stuff. You might want to do this in order to steal the accounts or just get someone to visit the site on their computer. So you basically put something, a bait to get someone to visit something. But you can also funnily enough do this in the physical world to get a person to visit something. And then you can influence them. Then you have dumpster diving. Now, how many of you has ever crawled through industrial or office garbage? In, you know, contain. It's just me. It's always just me. Uh, it's fun because you can find a lot of things that has been thrown away. So you can typically find people who here uses post-it notes. 
for instance, you tend to write very important pieces of information on these brightly colored yellow post-it notes that you then throw away once you use the account. So that's things you can look for. You can use for data, all hard drives. I was at our uh, municipal dump a couple of years ago, and someone had thrown away an entire rack storage service with literally hundreds of hard drives in the dump. I might theoretically have had a look at them and might theoretically there might have been data left. So people just threw away hundreds of gigabytes of data on the dump, which is a you know, public place. But we all do this. We throw away bills. One of my favorite things is if you ever have to prove your identity online, one of the common methods used in America is send us a copy of a recent bill like an electricity bill. So when I changed my the ownership of my domain, I, I validated my ID by sending a picture of an electricity bill. So that is each and every single one of your bills is actually an important identification tool in other cultures than ours. So that's fun. Um, Everyone will be scared. Then we have, uh, which was the wishing. Yes, we've seen a lot of QR codes to, during these two days. This is something attackers exploit now. So they put up malicious QR codes because QR codes get you to visit a web page on your device. So what they do is that they might put up stickers on actual uh, posters they put a new sticker up with their malicious QR code, or they just post QR codes in different places. So in Sweden, we have an, an online payment service called Swish, and you used it in flea markets or in stores, etc. and mostly it's based on QR codes. So you scan a QR code and you then accept payment on your phone. I was at a flea market last summer, and someone was, when people were trying to pay, someone was holding up on their phone their own QR code for payment. So you can generate on your Swish app a QR code as a recipient of payment. So they were just holding up their massive sized uh, phone in front of the official pay to this flea market here. And people were paying them on the phone instead. So a very low-fi attack with QR codes. Just hold your own phone up when someone else is paying. But imagine every single QR code you have might take you to a malicious place. It's just like clicking a link. And uh, you also have deceptive relationships. My favorite. That sounds good, kind of relaxing. So just to put this into perspective, some of the things we're looking at on is industrial espionage. People think it's like James Bond. You know, a cool person, quite often a man, comes to a place, you know, tears it down and goes away in four hours and steals all of your secrets. But looking at the Swedish security police, does someone want to guess on the time frame between first contact with an organization and and, and until you start to leak sensitive information. Start to leak sensitive information if you're an industrial spy. One year, two weeks, six months is an easy, two days. S one year, two seconds. Yes, this is fun. I have a nice time frame here of, you know, all around the room. No, it's seven years. So imagine this and we in universities are especially hit by this. So imagine how many or how few colleagues you worked with daily for up to seven years. And that's the typical timeline when people start to send out sensitive information. So the timelines of many attackers are way different from what we expect them to be. So most of my relationships that's been going on for more than seven years are what I would call very close friends. That's a good typical attack pattern. But this can be done in many ways over romantic frauds, etc. There's a bunch of psychological techniques. I'm not going to go into them too much. Authority is to act, well, scaringly enough, like an authority. Say, hey, I'm the police or I'm the professor. Or I'm the doctor. Do this. Like ability is getting people to like you because you're just a nice guy or a nice girl or whatever. 
urgency and scarcity is you have to do this now. The plane is leaving in a couple of hours. You have to get upgraded now or you lose your seat. Act now, now, now. There's only two upgrade seats. Commitment and consistency is if you do A, you're going to do B. If I've given you help or I helped you print a file before, I'm more likely to do it again. You have social proof, which is what is everyone else doing? So everyone here is using the public Wi-Fi. Everyone else is having their phones up. Everyone else is having their laptops up. That's the thing you do. It's unusual not to do the same thing as everyone else. And that's what the attackers do. And then you have reciprocity, which is always difficult to, to, to uh, pronounce correctly, which is basically, if I help you, you're prone to help me back. You can mess people up with this. Because you get them to do a service for you, which is just a minor one. They got to get hooked in or you do a service for them instead. So you help them with something they never asked you for. And then they're more prone to help you in return. These are all well-researched, well-established principles of manipulation. Chialdini is the, the, the author of these. So... What are we going to do now? Now you know the basics. Now you know the tool set of messing with people. So you're going to act as attackers now. We're going to sort you into eight groups. Uh, I can do a counting exercise later on, or you can self-sort into eight groups. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, which is a good idea, you are to steal a file from a lecturer. Let's call him Bob. He's on a visit to Crete. You're free to use any technique to do so that you want, as long as it's an attack against human weaknesses. Lie, cheat, steal, manipulate. Don't use violence. And I add this now because for a long time when I did this with my students, they had sophisticated plans on how to kill someone. Scaringly sophisticated plans on killing teachers. Uh, and that's also why we have Bob and not me. Because for a long time I heard stories about people planning to literally kill me in my office. Which wasn't as fun as you might imagine. So, No violence, but any kind of trickery, manipulation, attacks against human techniques, steal, theft, manipulate, do anything evil you can think about. But not violence. Your goal is to steal a file, which is basically just to get access to an unlocked computer. That's it. The computer is connected to internet. It has USB, etc. So the point is get access to an unlocked computer. Bob is attending this specific conference, living in a local hotel, which is uh, set up like yours. He travels by flight and taxi to get here, and it's just like you. This is what we're going to attack now. So you will have 10 minutes. We will sort ourselves into groups of eight and you will devise a way to attack him. You will try to steal his file. That's it. Um, you will then also prepare a 60-second-ish discussion on how you did this. What's your plan? Why, why, what are you going to exploit, etc. There's not going to be PowerPoint slides here. But just a brief description of Max a minute on how are we going to attack poor Bob. And there will be prizes for best and most creative attacks. So should I count or can you sort yourselves into groups of two-ish people? Let's see, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So most of you will be in groups of two. Some might randomly be in groups of three. Can you sort yourselves into this on your own? And you have 10 minutes to attack poor Bob. So how is all the groups going? Any, any groups that's done? Do you want more time or do, do, do you start to, to finalize your attacks? So I'll give you like a minute because the rest of the groups are, are done. So. What we're going to do now is the brief round of presentation. So we will speed this up a little bit. So I do hope everyone has ad, uh, created their attacks. Fair enough. Uh, you have at least a baseline of attacks. 
So we're going to do a very brief round where you describe the attacks that you created, how you want to attack poor Bob. We're also going to vote. You might notice now that you have two post-it notes, uh, creatively named B and C. There's a pattern to it. B is for best and C is for most creative. Whoa. So please double check that you do have one of each and don't give them away. Uh, that's a bad idea. There's, as I said before, going to be prices. So what we'll do now is that we'll have a brief round where every uh, group just described your attacks. And I will write a brief summary here because we will put our post-it notes up here afterwards. I don't have a whiteboard, so we'll improvise and do it this way. So first group is going to be this group, I guess. A brief description of your attack. Awesome. Thank you, group one. Group okay. two. We are we, uh, group two. <laughs> Hi, group two. I've heard good things. Yeah, so we, <laughs> we are at a conference. And um, it's a two day scheme. It's a yeah. two day scheme. Yeah. So the timeline is important. Yeah. On day one, um, I'm working away on the computer and then I have to leave. And then comes in Anna. You, you leave? No. So she's working on something and telling me, oh, I have a deadline tomorrow. I have to send this, this document tomorrow. It's really stressful. Bob, here's this. <laughs> We're close to Bob. And um, then in the evening, Marie might not be there. She's leaving. And then I mentioned casually that Marie is at the hotel working on this thing. It's really important that she can send that tomorrow, next day. I'm like, I come running down and ask, Anna, Bob is sitting nearby, obviously. Anna, I need your help. I have a problem with my computer. It crashed. But I'm very smart because I've done a lot of, you know, papers. So obviously I save a copy. It's like, Anna, can I use your computer? I have this copy here and I need just to log into my account and send it off. But Anna is not very helpful. I don't have a USB port on my computer. Obviously, I don't have one. <laughs> but hey, does someone have an USB port? Bob! <laughs> Bob, please help me. <laughs> so the rest is very similar yeah. to say. <laughs> awesome. But Thank we, you. we are basically very help, helpless yeah. and need yeah. help. Thank you to group two. Group three, logistically. Yeah. Well, so group three. I am here. Everybody knows me. I am taking part of the different activities. I have been maybe in a moment. We are uh, eating together. We know who I am. If I the last day on Friday, I say to you, please, uh, the application of the uh, 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 Arian company doesn't work on my mobile. Can I use your laptop to make the checking and print the the um, the tickets? And I got my USB device. I put it your laptop, and maybe because of you are polite, you are not going to prove uh, to to prove if I am doing the checking. Maybe you give me your laptop, and you don't see what I am doing, and I need just two minutes to take your the information I am searching for it. Maybe could be a good idea. Thank you. I, <laughs> if I need, <laughs> really, if I need to print my <laughs> my ticket, at least don't. No. Please trust me, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Next group. Next group. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> You need a solid 15 minutes for this. It's not, not very innovative, I think. Phase one, get to know Bob with the same conference. Phase two, sit next to him. Phase three, I have a problem with my computer. Can I borrow yours and see if my presentation with my memory stick works? And put the stick on the Bob's computer and that's it. Awesome. Thank you. But and you know the routine by now, next group. Okay, so let me take you back to when this plan started in 2018, when Oshin enrolled in sports management and leisure. 
So we knew that, um, I mean, Bob was a lecturer in this department. So Oshin specifically chose this course, enrolled, got closer to Bob throughout this time, four years, five years. We saw Tom, I mean, Bob's name enrolled for this um, conference to create. So we thought this would be the perfect time to get the file. So last night, Isabel and Oshin went out for dinner and the dinner ended up, I did not, I was sick. So I was at home on the laptop and Isabel and Oshin were getting Bob plastered on Reiki. <laughs> Oshin knows that Bob likes the GAA, Ireland's Football Association. So he made a page and I was behind the page last night while Bob clicked the link to get the tickets and gave me access to his computer. There's a match on when they come back from Crete. So, but Bob doesn't know there's no match. There's only me getting his files on his computer. So it's actually all done. Tom is none the wiser. I mean, Bob is none the wiser. And we already have the file. Awesome. <laughs> so group six, next group. Next group, there should be. Tom, is that you? I mean, Bob. So this started last year, I think. So we're going to use deceptive relationships with a bit of flirting thrown in. <laughs> Nothing more than that. So this is Bob. <laughs> Slash Tom. <laughs> So myself and Siobhan are accomplices and uh, we identified our catch and um, we were kind of like Charlie's Angels. We, were go we looked into what he's a sociology lecturer because we felt that was the one we could converse the most on. And um, we set up a fake LinkedIn account and we linked ourselves to a university. We reached out to Bob to make subtle friendship. And then we met him at the conference and we got closer and a bit closer. Not too close, just closer. <laughs> um, and then on the second day, kind of like the others, we had a mishap. We couldn't get into our computer to set up our presentation. The tears started flowing and we asked Bob, please, Bob, you can't let us away out of this. So Bob refused to help. So then we decided we were going to send some photographs to his wife of <laughs> something that might have happened, but didn't happen. But that was plan B if, if it didn't work. So this is the... Is it in the Awesome. Thank you. Next group. We have decided to use initially the allure of two silver haired ladies. So over lunch, we have chatted with Bob. We have admired his presentation, his skill, his knowledge of technology. And so we say, oh, you must tell us more, Bob. Do tell us more. So he, he is good. And when we come down before the two o'clock session, we look at Bob's computer. He opens his presentation. We're admiring the, 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 the technology he's using. And oh, my God, there is Tom. He is after falling in the men's bathroom. He is a diabetic. So Bob has to rush to get to Tom. I'm standing saying, you have to go in, Bob, because... Tom needs you. Meanwhile, Mary is on the laptop and we've got the file. Boom. Boom. Thank you. And group eight. So I'm not Bob. <laughs> no one so, is Bob. <laughs> we had um, two ideas. The first one is maybe more traditional, which is the beautiful model hired to go to Professor Bob, say, oh, uh, I'm a student. Your lecture was magnificent, so very fascinating. So am I doing my thesis, master thesis? It would be so fine to have your uh, file. So please, let go, let's go to have a drink. So this is the, the initial, no? traditional way. The second idea, maybe this is our 
proposal is to uh, put in the bag of the conference the typical uh, flash drive with the stamp of the um, conference, like you got from this conference, actually. Mm. <laughs> you know, in this USB um, flash drive, you can put a malware and to uh, lure the um, Bob, in this case, to click on a, on a um, mailing uh, file, malware file. So this file will steal every, everything in this computer. So this is our idea. Awesome. Thank you. So we have now eight alternatives. So you're to vote. You have two votes each. You put one of them, scaringly enough, on the best, one of them on the creative. You have an, a letter indicating which. You have one for each. So the instruction says, put your notes here and vote. And go up to the screen now. Yes, put them on. You can put them anywhere on the slides. Yep. And remember, there's prizes. So we're seeing that as far as my mouth is carrying me now, I see that group six won the best. And I see that group seven won the most creative one. So yes, there will be prizes for you. Uh, who's the best? And these are Swedish chocolates. And who's the most creative? You guys. Yeah, the, the, the group five have three Bs. Oh, they do. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so we have an equal scenario here. So you'll share the candies. So <laughs> there's a draw. So this is a fun debrief. Now, because of time. So the question here is, why didn't you cheat? Why didn't you cheat? Cheat with the voting. The entire purpose is to get you guys to think as attackers. I instructed you from the beginning that is lie, cheat, and steal this topic of the day. None of you did. Cheat. Moving anyone else's? Hey, it's easy to win. Move. <laughs> or collaborate with another group. Just structure it. Yes. No. Yes. But so normally when I do this, this is the end of a way longer series of lectures. I try to get the students to think as attackers. I try to get them to, you know, acknowledge that attackers don't follow the rules. But even in a scenario like this, we typically, all of my students historically has followed the rules. None have cheated. But we are trying to prevent a group of, to train a group of people to prevent attacks from people who cheat all the time. So I, I do actually prime the students during this entire seminar series to talk about lie, cheat, and steal. That's the good stuff. No one does. And there's an important part to this. And that is that you actually need to be able to think as an attacker. But even if you have spent an hour, or in this case, a full day, like my normal students do, trying to think as attackers, once you go into a rule setting, none of them cheat. So hundreds of students have done this. No one has cheated. And that's an important part to learn. So I use this all the time. They get way more detailed background information, of course. I mean, it's a fairly sophisticated scenario with, I think it's 10 pages of text that they are for a fake company that they are to pre prepare attacks for. They do get creative. They do get vicious. I have had to scale this down. As I said, murder was a recurring theme. Uh, and that's 
punish, but also quite scaring, uh, actually. The competitive uh, element makes them way more engaged. It really works well to get them to be more creative. Otherwise, people want to do baseline attacks and go home. But once there's prices, even small prices, I always have Swedish candies as prices, but there's the prestige of winning in competition with others. And it really does make a difference on the level of attacks. The thing, though, that's interesting here is how did you feel doing this? Because you were preparing and planning to do criminal activities against someone. But it was kind of fun, right? And that's something that's actually a little bit tricky to handle as a teacher, because we also have to remind people that, yes, there's a victim here. I mean, Bob has had a hard conference now. There's eight groups trying to manipulate and steal. But there's actual victims here. This is an actual crime. So there's a difficult aspect of it become, because it becomes so fun to do. And so challenging and so rewarding. And there's prizes, etc. So there's a point in having a discussion that you have just practiced doing criminal activities. The challenge is, though, that the actual criminal feels that this is fun. So your feeling isn't that different from actual criminals. And that's also something we need to understand because people actually think this is fun to do. They don't see it as an actual crime because, once again, no violence. So that's also something to remember. So I do encourage my students to cheat in a specific scenario. Uh, and I also kind of try to, to describe why. But this is a way to get people to understand why attackers work like they do, get them in the mindset. But the important part is the last one. The fact that they realize that even the, that they acted like attackers for a full day and tried to think as an attacker, when push comes to shove, none of them is an attacker. And that's the important lesson of this. It's not that you can attack, it's that you can act it for 15 minutes but you're still not going to act like them because there are different trends. And that's the learning exercise here. Thank you guys for playing along. Thank you for being awesome attackers and having very creative attacks. Uh, yes, question. I think the USB pattern is a very good one, but honestly, I would have used a registration slate, the first link for registration. Click on this link to register your information. And, and so... That would have been easy. I would just have fixed. Uh, once I got the first one, I would have sent out the second one and say, sorry, there's been an issue with your registration. The platform didn't work. So this is a second registration uh, registration for this precise event. So just yes, please visit this website. Um, and I mean, whoever double checks the sender of these emails, that, that never happens. So that would have been you know, an instant hack. Um, or since I'm very charming, I would have seduced him, but that's... Uh, why is everyone laughing? No. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry that I took up a bit of your uh, extra time here. Uh, so thank you guys so much. Oh, and this is an example from when I do it with students with a blackboard where notes actually stick. Thank you very much. There was a very important lesson for all of us to learn. Don't be Bob. <laughs>